Uber's impending initial public offering is expected to be one of the largest ever. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman recently visited their headquarters to better understand what happens when a San Francisco company puts economists in the driver's seat. It's the latest installment of Making Sense, our weekly economics series. We're in 65 countries and we see about 15 million trips a day. Uber, these days literally all over the map. So you'll see the biggest circles are where the, we see the most trips happening on our platform. Uber data scientist Corey Kendrick can track every ride worldwide, and there have been tons of them. About 10 billion trips since we started. Here at Uber San Francisco headquarters, the resulting data is analyzed by a team of in-house economists. My guess is overall between 20 and 30 PhDs. Jonathan Hall is Uber's chief economist. His mission? Writing papers, publishing them, uh, and, and trying to establish ground truth on tricky issues like the value of flexibility to the workforce. Of course, Uber's economists need to protect its bottom line, help it stay ahead of the competition. But Uber presents an unusual opportunity, the realization of many an economist's dream, efficient markets. Case in point, surge pricing. The economists really don't like the idea of the price not being able to change when supply or demand changes. So we have this algorithm called the surge algorithm whose purpose is to identify imbalances between supply and demand and, and solve them in, in a way that maximizes uh, the efficiency of the market. So when more passengers demand rides, prices go up to entice more drivers to supply them. Or take Uber's controversial, oft-criticized labor model. The drivers who are independent contractors can choose to work whenever they want, wherever they want, with essentially no restrictions. And that's very exciting uh, to an economist who believes in open markets and competition. So you are the embodiment of what economists would like an economy to look like? <laughs> uh, I, I think we strive for that. <laughs> There are some areas. So Hull's economic squad is mining the vast data collected by the Uber app to understand driver and passenger behavior and to tweak it. Women on average tend to do fewer trips per unit of time than men. One study analyzed data from over a million drivers to find a 7% gender earnings gap. We know it's not discrimination. There's a formula that determines how much they make. Stanford economist Paul Oyer, who did the research with Uber, says women make less for a less obvious reason. They drive slower, so the faster you drive, the more revenue you're generating because you're getting more rides in per hour. Hello, how are you? And since men give more rides, they get more experience. So if you go out and get in an Uber right now and there's a man driving, and then you go out and get in an Uber with a woman driving, on average, that man will have had more experience driving for Uber and therefore, he will be better at it and he will earn more money. While we were there, the Uber team explored one possible tweak. Having this per mile component essentially mechanically rewards for speed. So what this intervention considers is waiting less heavily on this per mile and more heavily on this per minute. Data is the driver, about tipping, for example, introduced in 2017. We consider the, the rollout of tipping uh, to be an important experiment and opportunity to, to get it right. And so you'll see changes happening over time. Because you're constantly testing, does this make people more generous towards drivers or less inclined to use Uber, or both? Both. But using the key metric of economics, the cost of losing customers was outweighed by the benefit of more motivated drivers. I think it is a really big change. And Stanford economist Susan Athey says many tech companies now employ economists to run the numbers. You have a bit of this image of Silicon Valley that somebody's sitting there, you know, thinking of a brilliant idea, you know, alone in a room and then putting it into practice. But actually, the real innovation that happens, um, especially for the larger tech firms, is just lots and lots and lots of incremental innovation randomized controlled tests, you know, thousands of them a year to try to improve algorithms, to try to improve systems, to make them better. Better, which ultimately means more profitable, whether consumers are on board or not. Jonathan Hall and I took an Uber with Haley McGonigal, who says the algorithms keep her busy, happily busy. I think a lot of the improvements lately have been to keep drivers constantly busy. Anytime you don't have a rider, that's of course lost wages right there. McGonigal was provided by Uber. She works morning rush hours, says she makes $35 an hour. 
But for some San Francisco drivers, the economist's dream can be the worker's nightmare. They've been decreasing how much money they pay to drivers year after year. Mustafa Mukled has been driving for almost four years. Instead of working like 40 hours a week, I'm forced to work at least 60, 70, 80 hours a week in order to pay my bills and pay all my expenses. We deserve a living wage. Bay Area drivers for Uber and rival Lyft have been protesting low pay with no benefits. Meanwhile, the IPOs of both companies will make many of their actual employees rich. There's a lot of frustration out there. Michael Martinez drives for Uber about 20 to 25 hours a week. If you include all of the costs, um, and you also include the constant rate cuts that have been going on over the last four years I've been doing it, I'm probably getting pretty close to just what San Francisco's minimum wage would be, to be honest. Uber says there have been rate changes in both directions, but that doesn't mitigate the impotence drivers feel in the hands of a faceless, forever tweaked algorithm. Whenever they do any changes, we are forced to accept and agree to their terms in order to go online and start driving. We have absolutely no power whatsoever. Uber does as they will, and we have no choice but to accept it. But despite their gripes, both Muckled and Martinez continue to drive. Main draw is the flexibility. To be honest, it's the only job that I can do while going to school. Unsurprisingly, Uber economists like Libby Mishkin studied the value of flexibility. Drivers worked more as a result of this flexibility because they don't have to commit to doing something that they might not want to do later. They can just choose to work whenever they feel like it. The economists also use data to answer critics on a myriad of issues, like the charge that Uber increases congestion in cities like New York. Uber rides lighting up the city on this map. There's really mixed evidence. And so one thing we're trying to do is make sure there's more rigorous research out there trying to get at this question. It's really hard to study for a number of reasons. Um, one is that there has been a lot of economic growth in the last 10 years, and there's more traffic when that happens. Suppose you did a study and found that Uber was the main contributor to congestion problems in New York, San Francisco, and elsewhere. Wouldn't you be constrained from telling everybody that that's the case? Some of these questions may be tough questions for us, but we would rather know the answer than not know. Congestion's bad for Uber, too. You know, our cars will be going slower. Um, we also have bikes and scooters, which are new modes on the platform that are trying to get people out of cars and into active modes. In short, more tweaking, with the data from mega millions of customers leading the way. And that's the new world of economics, says Susan Athey. Right now it's, you know, the Googles and the Amazons and the Ubers, but it's going to be the banks and it's going to be, you know, other manufacturing firms. So really all parts of the economy are going to digitize and start optimizing in a more scientific way. Eventually it'll all get routine. Because of the information you and I provide. From San Francisco, this is PBS NewsHour business and economics correspondent Paul Saltman.